Well, 100 years ago, when architecture enrolled its first student here, the world was on the cusp of a revolution. With industrialisation in the second half of the 1800s that Duncan's already mentioned, cities became magnets for people, for commerce, for ideas, for innovation. And because of that, they grew rapidly. So that even, but still, even 100 years ago, only 20% of the world's population lived in settlements of more than 20,000 people. But now, as we finish 100 years of built environment education at this institution, the first urban revolution has ended and the second one has begun. Commentators speak of living in an urban age and the 21st century has become one of planetary urbanisation. The foundation of that is simply that the large majority of the world's population live in cities, 55% at last count. But that's just the beginning. There's also an era of large cities. The proportion of people living in cities of more than 10 million is predicted to rise quite substantially. Increasingly, our cities will be crowded. And the second is that the city actually extends far beyond urban boundaries. The planet, according to some urban theorists, is urbanised. Even the remotest places on the earth are connected to cities as sites of resources needed to build and furnish urban lifestyles, as providers of labour to keep cities functioning, or as sites of tourism for the middle classes. Now, just as technology was put to work to solve the problems of the first urban age, think Henry Ford's Model T or the Otis Elevator that made tall buildings more functional and more possible and economical, technology is being put to work to solve the problems of this urban age. Technical knowledge and interventions are seen to fix problems like climate change, resource pressures, congestion, quality of life, even happiness. And these technologies are principally digital, encapsulated for me in one of, a lot of my work around the smart city, about big data, data processing, artificial intelligence, sensing and the like, that are going to create more efficient, economically successful and better places to live. I'm not a digital transformation expert, nor I'm not very good at futuring, um, but I have spent a fair bit of time researching what people do in cities and how people, what is urban life? And through that, I want to use that understanding to reflect on what this technological solution to our urban issues might be and how we might think it differently. Because I want to think about technology... Actually, I don't want to think about technology. I want to think about humans, the ways that we think about future cities as human cities, where human needs, aspirations and connections are the core foundations. And I'm going to try to convince you of that through the example of driverless cars. And I'm deliberately not going to say anything about the technology of a driverless car. But what I am interested in is the social life of driving. Beginning with it, well, why is it that people drive in cities? And then asking the question, how might those aspirations be accomplished by a technology that we call a driverless car? And what I want to argue is that there's a cost to simply uh, replacing a car with a driver to one without a driver. And there's a social and environmental cost. And if we put this, the human back at the centre of the debate, we actually end up with a different future. I want to start by just thinking about, well, why do we drive? I'm using the we. Perhaps some of you are not drivers, but I think in a city like Sydney, that's quite rare. There's lots of answers to the questions about why people drive. But I'm going to just talk about two. One of the main reasons people drive in a city like Sydney is to undertake travel for others, for social reasons. So many Sydney siders regularly drive children, family, friends to various activities around the city. Indeed, many daily activities are actually incredibly complicated, as suggested in the diagram. And it's because of that complexity, both spatially and temporally, that people drive. Cars are, in most cases, quicker. Um, they don't have fixed schedules. And they can take families, for example, to required places at the required time. A second reason people drive is to get to work, the commute. One of the reasons people always give for driving for the commute is that it is quicker. So again, we're having this sense of what, what, what is the time of, of driving. But it's interesting, I just wanted to do a shout out here to one of my colleagues, Jennifer Kent, did some amazing work a few years ago. That what she did is she interviewed some commuters. And uh, what she did is she provided them with an alternative to get to work that was quicker, but it was not by car. So basically she said, you could get this public transport trip now, you can get to work quicker. 
And surprisingly, they didn't take up the option. This was because what the drive offered them personally and culturally. It was more important to them, and most of them were men, it was more important to them that their time commuting be comfortable and that they be in control. So this sort of sense of we need to feel like we're in control of our lives in very busy, congested cities. And they associated driving with freedom and control. Um, through little things, it's like taking back roads in an attempt to beat traffic. And we're very proud of and attached to the idea that they took ownership of what they were doing on that daily hour or less commute to work. So in both these examples, these cultural perceptions and practices are actually important. It's about the drive actually is not just about getting to A to B, and it's actually not really about the car or the technology of it. So how might a driverless car, if you think about, well, OK, a new technology, meet some of these cultural aspirations? Well, in the case of children, probably relatively easily. So as this graphic suggests, it will be possible for children to be autonomously chauffeured to their activities. It would allow the children of those currently who do not or are unable to drive to be chauffeured as well. The issue of parental perceptions of safety would certainly remain. Um, there's some research at the moment trying to figure out at what age um, might parents let their child get in an autonomous vehicle? It's an interesting question to ask yourself. And for the commute, which is what most of the popular conversation is at the moment around driverless cars, the idea is that rather than battling traffic, the drivers can sit back and relax as a car takes them to work and takes them back home. So drivers could feel cocooned in their cars, which is one of the cultural correlates of, of driving, but there might be a lack of autonomy and control. I mean, how can you, could you tell your autonomous vehicle to take the back road if it was just maximising its route using its algorithms? So just using my two examples, why people drive, um, driverless cars can meet the social needs of people driving. But if we consider the cultural reasons why people drive, then the answer is not really straightforward. But what I've just sketched is that simple trans, um, translation of a new technology onto old habits, driving private cars. So we continue our pattern of individual ownership of cars. Everyone's car becomes autonomous. People's commutes become more convenient and arguably more safer. So people who used to take public transport might decide to drive since they can sit in their car reading, chatting, texting, things they can't do if they're driving. But that's not a good scenario for our futures tomorrow or in the next 100 years. It further incentivises urban sprawl, does not address the health and social costs of car dependence, um, inactivity and obesity, premature, from car, premature death from car-generated air pollution, road deaths, injuries. Car use has generational impacts as well. It's associated with the declining independent mobility of children which impacts their ability to navigate streets safely as pedestrians and isolates them from local communities. So car use has, um, so, so in continuing along in our car-focused way but doing away with the driver, improvement in quality of life is um, marginal at best. But there is another option. Let's adopt a human-centred perspective on driverless cars. And from this perspective, driverless cars are an opportunity to imagine urban transport as green or as shared or as radically different. Green and they might be powered differently than gasoline. Shared in the sense that they're not privately owned. Um, shared vehicles. And there's a new entrant into our ways of getting around the city. Uh, small scale shuttle buses, for example, that are driverless. These shuttles take us from our house to the closest train station or, or bus, um, bus transit uh, intersection. Well, they deliver us to our, our workplace on demand in sync with our timetables, not their own. So this scenario is not actually just about driverless cars. It starts from the question of how we want transport in our cities to meet our needs as humans. And then it asks, well, how can driverless vehicles help us achieve this vision? So we don't just have driverless cars, but we have optim optimised mass transit, a fully connected smart city. So the cultural correlates of this vision are emerging, and I can't imagine what it will be like in 100 years' time. But we know, for example, that the current generation of young Australians are much less likely than their parents to have a driver's licence or to own a car. Mobile phones are replacing cars as status symbols. 
Getting a lift is much easier and much more socially acceptable. So maybe we are ready to give up both driving and owning. So driverless, we might have the, the era of driverless car share cars or driverless vehicles that we haven't even imagined that might look completely different might be upon us. So for me, a driverless car future needs a transport vision that is about the automation of ways of getting around, but that an automation that can help shift cars into the background. A driverless car future is one that reimagines what we think of as a vehicle. So to return to the idea of this provocation, let me end with a really simple challenge. And the challenge is to, to, to reflect upon as we, as we go through the day, how can we build cities, and I think we're up to cities 4.0 now, that are humane, human scale, and really the foundation of human flourishing. Thank you.